Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year from Northeast India. Yes, uh, Reverend Jeff said, my name is Tang. In fact, my name is quite a bit long. It comes one Tang Valte. So, yeah, I, I think uh, it might be difficult for everyone to pronounce my full name. So I made it uh, shorter so that everyone could easily understand my name. So my name is Tang. You can call me as Tang. Yeah, I'm from Northeast India and I work with WEC International since 2016. I did my candidate orientation in 2016 and involving in uh, various ministries wherever the Lord leads and wherever the Lord needs me. And I'm really, really happy to be here and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, uh, my friend Jafion and and the other facilitator. And once again, thank you so much. And I am so excited and I'm so thrilled to see the excitement of my brothers and sisters joining from Kenya uh, for, the, for the sake of world missions, the evangelization of, of the world. So thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to, to be in your midst today. And before we start, yeah, I'd like to do share screen. Yeah. So are you able to see and are you able to hear my voice? <laughs> Is it loud and clear enough? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Well, uh, before uh, I begin my uh, session, I'd like to read a scripture portion. This morning I am uh, touched by, by the calling of uh, Jeremiah. So I just want to read some portion of the calling of Jeremiah from the Old Testament. And from verse 6, uh, from verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Verse 6. Ah, sovereign Lord. I say, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send to you and say whatever command I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reaches out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy, overthrow, to build, and to plan. The Lord reaches out, reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said, Now I have put my words in your mouth. This morning I am really touched by this, uh, the call of Jeremiah, by the Lord. I have blessed. I touch God, touch the mouth of Jeremiah and said, I have put and I have kept, I have placed my word in your mouth. So this morning we'll be looking at uh, the biblical perspective of missions. And by the way, I'm not. Uh, going to bring up any new topics, any, any new things, any new issues. This is something that we have uh, already knew and we have already heard so many times, thousands and thousands of times in our uh, several years of experience of a Christianity and in the church. So do not expect me to bring something new which we have never heard, but just to bring up those familiar passages, the words from the Bible, and all the, the teachings, the topics that we have be, been learning and hearing uh, throughout our journey 
spiritual journey, especially in our journey in the Lord with missions. But I am bringing up this topic, the biblical perspective of missions, just to remind us once again the urgency of mission, the significance of mission, and our importance, our significance in, in bringing out, in caring, in fulfilling the missions of God. So uh, allow me to share with you this morning on to talk about the biblical perspective of missions. And by the way, some of you may not be uh, uh, familiar with where is Northeast India in the world. You can, you can check your world map and see India. And India, you can look at Manipur. And from Manipur, I am from Churachandpur, a very small town and in a very remote, remotest area of Northeast India. So I'm married with uh, my wife and we have two children. Sorry, I was not preparing to, to <laughs> show you the, uh, my family picture. I could have prepared and show some of my family pictures, but sorry about that. But once again, thank you so much for having me here and giving me the privilege to, to talk and share with you and, and yeah, the urgency of this. <laughs> Yeah. Before this, uh, I want us to ask ourselves the simple question. Is the Bible the basis of mission or mission as the basis of the Bible? Which one is uh, true to you? Is the Bible the basis of mission? Or is it? We do, the, we do mission because the Bible says so. Or mission as the basis of the Bible. As we begin to talk about the biblical perspective of missions, I want us to, to think about the simple uh, statement and question for ourselves and ask ourselves, is the Bible the basis of mission? Or mission as the basis of the Bible? The whole Bible is the product of God's mission. And God's, it is God's engagement in God's world through God's people. For God's purpose, and that is the purpose of God, is the redemption of God's creation. So the whole Bible is the product of God's mission. Some of uh, many people, when I share about this uh, thing, they think that we are a bit exaggerating because looking at everything from the lens of missions. But looking at the Bible as a whole, from Genesis to Revelation. There's one thing that we came up, and that is the whole Bible is the product of God's mission. And it is about God's engagement with God's world. And through God's people, uh, especially the Old Testament is about uh, the, the Israelites, and for God's purpose. And God's purpose of creating human beings, God's purpose of, uh, of creating the universe, the world is to have a fellowship, to have a, a worship time with him, a quality of worship time with him. John Piper said that mission exists because worship doesn't. In fact, the, the original purpose, the, the, the purpose of God creating human beings and the universe is that his created being will we'll worship him, we will have a fellowship with him. That was the, the original purpose of God, creating human beings in the universe. But unfortunately, the purpose of God creating human beings, his created being worship him and in fellowship with him cannot be fulfilled because of the fall of man. And because of that, but God 
is still wanting to restore, redeem his created beings, his creation from eternal damnation. And therefore, in the, in the Garden of Ed, though Adam and Eve may fall and may be isolated from God, God is still reaching out his hand in the Garden of Eden and saying, where are you, Adam? And that's mission. God is looking for his people. God is searching for his people to restore them and to redeem them. So, uh, John Piper rightly said that mission exists because worship doesn't. So this is what is written. As you can see in Luke chapter 24, verse 46 to 48. The Christ who suffered raised from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So this is what is written in the Bible, in the scripture. So we are to read the Old Testament, the scriptures, and the New Testament. And especially the Old Testament, because many said that the Old Testament has nothing to do with missions. It's about the history of Israelites. It's about the ministry of the prophets. It has nothing to do with missions. But reading from this passage, like Luke chapter 24, verse 46 to 48, direct us to say that, that to read the Old Testament scriptures in the light of Messiah, and his mission. We'll be looking at those things in details. So, one thing that we must be very careful is we must never be so pragmatic as to, to just do church or do missions without first asking the important question. What is the biblical basis for doing what we are doing? Now, we have been talking about missions, world missions, evangelism, and yes, yeah, so many things. Uh, about missions. We have workshops and missions. We have uh, lectures and missions. We have uh, missions motivation. So many programs on mission. But the first thing that we must be aware is that what is the biblical basis for doing what we are doing? Is there any biblical uh, support, stand, uh, standpoint for what we are doing? What we're talking about, missions. Is the Bible is supporting what we're doing? Are we doing according to the teaching of the Bible, in other words. So what is the biblical basis for doing what we are doing? Is missions biblical? Is missions mentioned in the Bible, of, in, the, in the Bible, in the word of God? You know, Ralph Winter is from the US Center for World Missions said, it, the Bible is not the basis of missions. Mission, is the basis of the Bible. The question that I, uh, we, we had previously, is the Bible the basis of mission or mission the basis of the Bible? Here Ralph Winter had his answer for this question. And he said that the Bible is not the basis of missions, rather missions is the basis of the Bible. The common understanding of many Christians today, the common teaching of many Christians today is that the Bible is the basis of missions. We are doing missions because the Bible says so. Because of the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples. So we are doing missions because the Bible says so. So that was the common understanding and the common teaching in, in, in many, uh, yeah, many Christian, Christian norm today. But in fact, what we would like to say this morning is missions is the basis of the Bible. Not the Bible is the basis of mission. We have been known as a people who call Bible things by Bible names. Two Bible things in Bible ways. So we should always want to be a people who think and feel and act in a biblical manner. So 
my point here is, are we doing, as we claim to be a Christian, are, as we claim to believe in the biblical authority, the authenticity of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible, are we doing our missions? Are we doing our Christian, are we practicing our Christian life according to the biblical manner? This is one thing that we have to think about. So, the question is, so then, what is the biblical basis of missions? Missions never originated in the mind of man. It is, missions is not founded by man. Missions is not discovered by man. The idea of missions never originated in the mind of man. You know, missions began first in the heart of God. As you can see in the Bible, from one man, he met all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. The Bible clearly states that it is God. Mission is the heartbeat of God. It is his idea. This, this idea is originated from God and not from man. John Stott said, we must be global Christians with a global vision because our, our God is a global God. And God is a global God. God is not for just a particular community. God is not just for a, a particular people group. God created the whole thing. He is sovereign. All the earth, all the universe, all the people groups, all the races, and everything is in his sense, belongs to him. So God is a global God. So we must be a global Christians. We must be a global Christian with a global vision. Looking at the big picture of life, looking at the big picture of Christianity. So this is what John Stott said. We must be global Christians with a global vision. Because our God is a global God. For God so loved the world. So he loved the world. He is a global God. He's not just a one nation God. He's not just a one people God. He is a God of the world. So the Bible clearly says that his mission of sending Jesus Christ is because he loved the global world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So looking, John Stott encouraged us to look at the bigger pictures of of life, of Christianity, and ministry, and church. From Adam to Abraham, God wanted men to inhabit the whole earth. From Eden to eternity, God has desired for his people to be global, to spread across the face of the globe. Looking at Genesis, from the first man, Adam, to the father of the nation, Abraham, what we can see is that God, in the covenant that he made with these people, like Adam, Abraham, Noah, and others, is to inhabit the whole earth. It's not just to inhabit or to feel some portion of the land, some portion of, of the world, of the earth. No, feel the earth was God's message to these people from Adam to Abraham. So God wanted men to inhabit the whole earth from Eden to eternity. So God has desired for his people to be global, to spread across the face of the globe. Let's look at the missions in the Old Testament. God blessed them and said to them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he said, God blessed them and say to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. The first creation of man, like the first human being, 
God said, he blessed them. The Bible said, he blessed them and said to them, God said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And in Genesis 9, following the great flood, God repeats this fill the earth commission. Then God bless Noah and his son saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So notice that in both cases, God blessed his people in order that they might fill the earth. So God's intention, God's message, God's message to the human beings, the first human, and in the Old Testament was to fill the earth, to multiply, fruitful, increase in number, multiply and fill the earth. So that is God's message to his people. So inhabit the whole earth, fill the earth. So why was God so concerned that his people be a mobile and missionary people? Why was so God concerned about filling the earth? Why was God so concerned about, about his people? We have already seen the answer to these important questions in Paul's message to the Athenians. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, as we read earlier. Paul, Paul's message to Athenians. God was so concerned about his people. God was so concerned about his people to be a mobile and missionary people because he did this so that they would seek him. Human beings would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him so that human beings would be consigned to God. So God was so much concerned about his people. God longs for mankind to seek him, reach out to him, and at last find him. So finding God is the final analysis is what missions is all about. So what is missions that we are doing and that we are talking about? Finding missions at the end is finding God. Missions is about finding God, seeking him, reaching to him, and finding him. So finding God is the final analysis is what missions is all about. So coming back to the Old Testament, after the flood, Noah became a farmer, planted vineyards, and died at the age of 950. That's what the Bible says. And what happened after his death? His son's families became nation builders and started to spread out, as we can see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 32. So everyone spoke the same language. Genesis 11, 1 recorded. So in that time, at that time, everyone spoke the same language. How convenient their life would be, you know, as uh, speaking the same language, you know, communication and giving information. Everything will be very co convenient. Now we are facing such a challenges in missions, in the task of missions, because language is one of the greatest barriers. We have to learn language. We have to uh, adapt with the culture of the host culture. So, so many things and so many inconveniences in doing missions, so many challenges. But those days in the time of, of Noah and before, the Bible records that everyone spoke the same language. So what's the commission about to be fulfilled? As people move eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Genesis 11, 2. But what happened was, we know in the book of Genesis, people would fulfill the earth, inhibit the, 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 they will spread and inhibit the, uh, the earth. But Genesis 11.2 records that as people move eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And what does this mean? 
The NIV Bible has a footnote for Shina that is Babylonia. So we can see that they settled there, but this is not good. Why not good? Because God's idea of people is that they should spread and they should scatter and, and feel the earth. Feel the earth. That was God's intention in human beings. But in, instead of spreading and feel the earth and instead of scattering, they settled there, all of them together. So that was against God's idea, God's idea. So what happened was someone came up with, maybe come up with a bright idea. And then they say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for us, ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God wants them to scatter, but they want to settle in one place. By saying, come, let us build ourselves a city. So by settling down in one place, instead of scattering and instead of uh, spreading and filling the earth, they want to scatter. And in, 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 in fact, they wanted to reach us to heavens. They wanted to reach us into heaven instead of scattering and spreading and, and fill the earth. So God was not happy with this idea. And what happened was, you know, how quickly and easily they were di diverted from God's field, the art commission. So it makes us wonder who planted that sinister seed thought in the collective minds. Someone who did not want God's commission to be fulfilled for sure. And that would be sudden. God's commission with man was that they would feel the art. They would scatter feel the earth and spread across the globe and feel the earth. But the Israelites, instead of spreading and scattering, what they did was they tried to confine in one place and build a tower, a tower of Babel, and reach us to heavens. And they said, let us make, build a place in our name. So God's idea was the Israelites would spread, scattered, and fill the earth. But that was not fulfilled because the Israelites, they disobey. They want to settle instead of scattering. And, and, and Satan was using, you know, planting those ideas, setting, so, showing these sinister ideas in the hearts of human beings to rebel against God. James O. Fraser, who he was a missionary to China. He once said, I know enough about Satan to realize that he will have all his weapons ready for determined opposition. He would be a missionary simpleton who expected plain sailing in any work of God. I have watched his video, James of Fraser. Uh, he was working among the Lisu uh, people groups of the Chinese, China uh, Lisu tribe. So in his video, he was, you know, once into a spiritual warfare. So much depressed and disappointed because of the, the Satan was working effectively and trying to attack him in, at all fronts in his ministry. So he, this James of Fraser, he clearly says that I know enough about Satan to realize that he will have all his weapons ready for determined opposition. So especially when it comes to mission, Satan is always active and always effective, looking for every opportunity to attack and to derail the plan of God, the mission of God. So God's plan was that the people, the Israelites will scatter and spread and fill the earth. But human beings, because Satan was using uh, their rebellious minds and thoughts, instead of scattering, they planned to settle at one place and build a tower that reaches to heavens. And God was displeased with these ideas. And the, the uh, result was, the consequence was really bad. 
So God had to personally come down from heaven to alter their plans, to knock down their arrogant altar as it were. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. So this is what the Bible says. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. Before Babel, the Bible records that the people, they speak one common language and it was very convenient for them. But because of their rebellious minds against the plan of God, God had to solve. And he, what happened was, he scattered them from there all over the earth. And he confused their language. And confusion happened at the end and then inconvenience, so many inconvenience. So because the, the, there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The Bible says, if you read Genesis 11, verse 8 and 9. There is only one letter's difference between Babel and Bible. You know, A. Only one. A and I. When we don't do it the Bible way, Babel, that is confusion, is the consequences, is the outcome. When we don't do it the Bible, when we disobey God, the result is confusion. The result is failure. Babel is the way of human wisdom and endeavor when it comes to missions. So we are here today to discern the biblical basis of missions, not to foolishly follow the Babylonian base of building cities, towers, and making a name for ourselves. God's people have always been rather reticent and resistant to the divine plan for missions to inhabit the whole earth. So we are getting ahead of ourselves here, but for a quick moment, let us be reminded of the young church in Jerusalem. You know, the apostles had been given the great commission, all nations, all the world, to the end of the earth. It took a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem before they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The first two reasons the apostles had been commissioned to evangelize back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but even at that, it was the church and not the apostles who did the scattering. You know, looking at the Tower of Babel, the history of the Israelites, and the church in Jerusalem has some commonality. You know, the apostles in the, the, the Jerusalem church, they were given the Great Commission. The Great Commission was to be a blessed to all nations, to all the world to the end of the earth. But the apostles, they reluctant to spread, to scatter. Instead, they want to remain at one place, settle at one place. But what happened was a persecution came. And because of a great persecution, whether they like it or not, the church scattered, the Bible says, says scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. These are the first two reasons the, the apostles had been commissioned. To evangelize begs in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But even then, it was the church that did the scattering because of the persecution. But the apostles, they remained reluctant to scatter. So the Torah about the, the history of Israelites and the young church in Jerusalem, especially the apostles, had shared many commonalities about this. <clears throat> So Acts chapter 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So why missions, why the gospel spread, the good news spread? It was because of the scattering of the people because of the great persecution. They scattered, they had to take refuge in some other places. Some had gone to nearby, some had gone to very far flock areas to, and wherever they went, they preached, they shared the word of God. 
That's how the ministry, the missions was spread in the early church. The life lesson in both stories is that God wants us to scatter. But the sad truth is that many times we would rather settle. Instead of scattering and bringing good news to the people, we would rather remain, love to remain, or rather to settle in our comfort zone. So this is something that we have to think as a church, as a leaders today in our mission journey. Oswald J. Smith observed that the church that does not evangelize will fossilize. The church that does not evangelize will not grow, cannot grow. So that the growth of the church, the, the, mark, the, the mark of a growing church is each action is known in its action or activities in evangelizing or missions. So Oswald J. Smith clearly states that the church that does not evangelize will fossilize. And back to Genesis chapter 12, it is so pivotal in God's plan for missions and redemption. He had told Adam, fill the earth. He had told Noah, fill the earth. Noah's son started to fill the earth, but God bogged down at Babel. So God himself came down and scattered his people to give them a jump start. But they still needed a leader, an example of someone who would take God at his word and get this business of inhibiting the whole earth. And that is serious. So God chose a man, one man, Abraham, to become a channel of blessing to all peoples of the earth. So the Lord had said to to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 1-3. So that's what we call Abrahamic covenant, the commission of Abraham. So God chose this remarkable man because he knew his heart. He knew he would up, up, uphold his end of the bargain. So God said, I have chosen Abraham for a reason, namely that he will carefully instruct his children and his household to keep themselves strong in relationship to me and to walk in my ways by doing what is good and right in the world and by showing mercy and justice to all others. And God said, I know he will uphold his end of the covenant so that he can ensure my promises to him will be fulfilled and upheld as well. So Genesis 18, 17 to 19, God's musing why he chose Abraham. God chose Abraham out of so many Israelites because Abraham was trustworthy. Abraham walked with faith, in faith. So Abraham was found righteous in the eyes of the Lord and he was found to be faithful. So God chose a faithful man, a trustworthy man, a committed man, a dedicated person like Abraham to fulfill his mission, so fill the earth. So, in one sense, we can say that we, God chose Abraham because Abraham had a missionary heart. You know, he rescued his troublesome nephew Lot. He pleaded with God for the wicked citizens of Sodom. So some people even say that Abraham was the first to intercede for a city, for, for an urban. So, that shows that God uh, loves for urban mission, urban ministry, because and and Abraham was the first person uh, who who did urban missions movement, urban missions ministry, because he interceded, he pleaded with God for the city of Sodom, wicked citizens of Sodom. So I think that he would have liked the song "Rescue the Perishing." I hope we all know this song, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, Snatch them in the pity from sin and, and the grave, Weep over the erring one, 
lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus mighty to save. So Abraham, God chose Abraham because Abraham had a missionary heart. He loves for the, the lost. Uh, so he wants to rescue them. He wants to bring them to God. And God chose Abraham. And let's look at Jonah, the prophet. He was known as a reluctant missionary. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. We all know the story of Jonah. He was at first, the reluctant missionary at first. God sent him to, but he chose his own, own interest. And he went according to his wills and directions. So we, we know the story. We know very well about Jonah's story. And I like what uh, Thomas Kells said about this man, Jonah. And Jonah stopped to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonas in their comfortable houses to come around to his way of loving. And coming to Psalm, the book of Psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 67 is is known as a missionary chapter. In Psalm 67, we see that how God wanted the entire nation of Israel to be mission-minded. So Psalm 67 has been called the missionary chapter of the Old Testament. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known, as, known on, on earth, your salvation among all nations. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. Talk about this. Your ways may be known on earth. Your salvation among all nations. And because of all this, Psalm 67 has been known as the missionary chapter of the Old Testament. So why did God bless Israel? God blessed Israel so that they would make God's way known to on earth. So that all nations might come to know God's redemptive love and experience of God's saving grace. Through the people of Israel, other nations, the Gentiles, and all other nations might know God's redemptive love and experience God's saving grace. The response of Robert Morrison to a skeptic is really interesting. The man looking at him with a smile that only half concealed his contempt inquiry. Now, Mr. Morrison, do you really expect that he will make an impression on the idolatry of the Chinese empire? He said, no, sir, said Morrison, but I expect that God will. Has God made his impression on China? Yes. Imminently so. So it is not Morrison. It is not us. It is not the church. But it is God that work. It is God that make that impression, that impact. The prophets. If you look at the prophets, coming to the prophets, the prophets were faithful in proclaiming this to the nations, message to the nations. If you look at Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet during four administrations, declared that all nations would stream to the Lord's house. In chapter 52, verse 10, he said, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the nations, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Even the, the prophets like Isaiah, they proclaim about the message of, of the salvation of the Lord. So Isaiah, the prophet, is about a missionary message. He's bringing the salvation, the good news of salvation to the people. And Jeremiah, as I read before at the beginning of this session, 
Zeremiah prophesied, he was called to be a missionary. As he said, at the time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. What at the time, the throne, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all nations, not just the Israelites, all nations, ethnic, will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. Habakkuk say, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. It's a message of good news, salvation, redemption. It's a missionary message. Haggai. Haggai declare, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will find this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai declare the message of the Lord, salvation, that all nations will come and will fill this temple with glory. Zechariah announced he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Malachi, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, rounds up the Old Testament with this. All nations pronouncement from the Almighty God. My name will be great among the nations. From where the sun rises, to where it says, in every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. So what we can see from the Old Testament, from the first book, Genesis, to Malachi, it's all about missions. It's all about God's people. It's all about, not just the Israelites, but it's all about all the nations coming to God, the redemption purpose of God. So missions is very much biblically best. So it's not just mission, it's not just we are doing missions because of the great of, of the new of the Great Commission in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. But the Bible is not the basis of missions, but missions is the basis of the Bible from Genesis, even till Revelation, the New Testament, it will continue. The same story, the story about God's love for his people. But tragically, the sad thing is that Israel did not fulfill their mission to be a blessing to the nation. God chose the Israelites, God chose the Israelites to fulfill his mission to be a blessing to the nations. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. In fact, according to Jesus, they killed and stoned the prophets who were sent to them. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. <clears throat> now let's move to missions in the New Testament. So what we can see in the Old Testament, it's all about God's love for his people. God seeking and sending his people, uh, his prophets and his messengers, so that people, the entire earth will be restored and redeemed. So it's all about missions. Missions in the New Testament. So in the fullness of time, God sent his own son, Jesus the Christ, to our, the greatest missionary the world has ever known. I don't know whether you are able to accept Jesus as the greatest missionary, but to me, at least Jesus is the greatest missionary, the greatest international or cross-cultural missionaries. David Livingstone said, God had only one son, and he was a missionary, a poor, poor example of him I am. But in this work, I now live. And in this work, I wish to die. So David Livingstone acknowledged the, identity, the true identity of Jesus Christ. 
as a missionary. But he said, he is a poor, poor example of him. David Livingston, he is no compare. He is no comparison to Jesus, the Son of God, a missionary. But he said, I, in this work, I now live in this missionary journey. And in this world, I wish to die. Very strong statement from David Livingstone. An angel in the little town Bethlehem made a global announcement. Don't be afraid. Listen, I bring good news. News of great joy. News that will affect all people everywhere. If you read Luke chapter 2 verse 10. Recently we have celebrated Christmas. And Christmas is about missions. The message of Christmas is this. Luke chapter 2 verse 10. It's about missions. Don't be afraid. It's a comforting message. Listen, I bring good news. News of great joy. And what is that news of great joy? News that will affect all people everywhere. That a savior is born. So Christmas is about missions. The message of Christmas is missions. Jesus Christ quickly identified his church and rescue mission to the earth. And Jesus told him, Zacchaeus, as we all know, this shows that salvation has come to this home today. This man was one of the lost sons of Abraham. And I, the Messiah, have come to church for and to, to save such souls as his. Jesus' mission and purpose was made very, very clear. His manifesto was made very clear here, declare. That is to bring salvation, to bring hope, to bring life, to rescue people, and to reconnect people to God. So salvation has come to this home today. The Jesus' mission was to bring salvation to human beings, to our lives, to our families, to the world, to the entire world. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Henry Martin said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. So the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. Jesus Christ, his purpose, his sole purpose is to share about this good news, to bring about this good news, this good tidings of Christmas, this good tidings of being, bringing salvation to the people. So he said, Henry Martin said, the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. The nearer you know about who Jesus Christ is, the nearer, the more you want to become a missionary, the more you are convinced and, and convicted of your call to mission. Our Lord laid great emphasis on the importance of unity in the matter of missions. And for these missions, Jesus said, this is not about individual ministry. This, this is not my ministry. This, this is not individual ministry. This is not just one, uh, just one church ministry. He wants us to unitedly work when it comes to missions. So he prayed for oneness among his disciples. He even prayed for our oneness so that we would be effective in evangelism. 12 hours before he went to the cross, you know, he said this prayer. He prayed, he, he offered this powerful prayer for us. I am praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me. Because of them and their witness about me, the goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they might be one heart and mind with us, then the world might believe that 
the world might believe that you in fact sent me. So Jesus was praying for the world, the Christians, the people to unite as he and his father, they are in one. So missions, Jesus clearly teaches us that missions is not just one nation world. It is not just individual ministry. It's all corporate ministry, collective ministry that we must be in one heart and in one mind, unitedly serve in missions. His first commission to the 12 apostles was a limited commission. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with this instruction. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. His great commission was given moments before his ascension. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The first commission was limited to Israel. The second, final, and great commission was greater in scope for all the nations. This is because God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. So God's will is that everyone must be saved. Everyone must be saved. Anyone should not perish but that all should come to repentance. Hudson Taylor noted that the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. So when God gave, when Jesus gave this, uh, the Great Commission, he did not give us with an option. He did not say that if you are willing, he did not say. The Bible did not record that. And the Bible did not say that when Jesus gave this commission, when do go and make disciples when you are having free time. Go and make disciples when you have enough money. The Bible did not say that. The Bible did not say that. Go and make disciples when you have your own church building. When you have uh, acquired enough, enough properties, church vehicles. When you have enough uh, financial, when you are in a good financial position, go and make disciples. No, Jesus did not say that. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. And in the end, he said, I will be with you always. So Hudson Taylor, he said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's an imperative, as we all know. It's a command from our master. This is something that we must do, no matter what. Our church position is, our financial position is, our health position is. This is something that we cannot say no. We must say yes to the Great Commission because there is no an option. It is not an option to be considered. And what about X when we come to X and missions? The apostles took very seriously this global commission. If you look at the book of Acts, around the third century, origin of Alexandria wrote that the apostles divided up the world between them. Eusebius also wrote about this division of labor. The apostles and disciples of the Savior scattered over the whole world and preached the gospel everywhere. Probably the first countries visited were those mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. According to tradition, Peter took Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. We do, not, we do know that Peter did write to Christians these same places. If you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And Thomas is said to have been assigned Parthia, today's India. So we have St. Thomas tradition in India. 
the south southern coastal of India, we have Saint Thomas. We we have a tradition that Thomas, the apostle Thomas, came to India, and we have Saint Thomas grave, Saint Thomas uh, temple, Saint Thomas. We have Mar Thomas, Saint Thomas uh, followers, as a Christian denomination. So we have a tradition. And Andrew went to Scythia, today's uh, Ukraine, Turkey, and Greece. And Philip went to North Africa. Matthew went to Persia, today's Iran, and Ethiopia. Bartholomew went to Armenia and Southern Arabia. And Zayn, son of Alphys, went to Spain. So this is uh, some of the records that we have. Uh, some scholars they have uh, studied and come up with saying that these apostles went to these nations, these countries. <clears throat> the apostles did not think in terms of close countries. And you, got to, you can get anywhere if you go to serve. The book of Acts has been called the Authorized Missionary Manual of the Church. The full title is The Acts of the Apostles. We have just the Acts, but the full title of the book is The Acts of the Apostles. So this, it is a missionary manual. It is a missionary book, authorized missionary manual of the church. But you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is the catalyst, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The power from on high fell upon them on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, after the upper room prayer meeting. A.T. Pearson has observed that every step in the progress of missions is directly traceable to prayer. One thing that we could observe from the, the early missionaries, the apostles in the book of Acts is their prayer life, their prayer life. They plug into the power of prayer. They plug into the power of proclamation. They plug into the power of patience. So this is something that is uh, significant in the early, the characteristic of the early Christianities, their prayer life. So the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit empowered them. Power from on high fell upon them after the upper room prayer meeting. You know, friends, today, uh, one thing uh, that separates the difference between early Christianity and today's Christianity, as I observe, is this, our prayer life. You know, the early Christianity, the first century Christians, after their prayer, the neighboring, the earth was shaken because of their prayer. The environment was shaken because of their prayer. But today's Christianity, I don't know about uh, Kenya and Africa, but yes, I observe the Christianity that is now in our, our context. We pray only when we are shaken. But the early Christianity, because of their prayer, the world is shaken. The environment is shaken. Because the power from on high fell upon them, the day of Pentecost. The world is shaken. But we only pray today. Today is Christian. We only pray when we are shaken. We only pray when we need some help from the Lord. We, we only pray when we need finance, when we are in lack of finance. When we, we only pray when we are in sick. So the difference between our Christianity and early Christianity of the early Christian church was because of their prayer, the environment was shaken. But we pray only when we are shaken. But A.T. Pearson said that every step in the progress of missions is directly traceable to prayer. Only with prayer we can be an effective missionaries. We may be well equipped theologically. We may have so, acquired so many degrees. We may, we may have the financial uh, you know, uh, resources. But if we lack 
our prayer life, then we have to really, really think about our missions. Prayer is the key. In chapters 2 through 7, we see the church as Christ spirit filled with SS in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 5, verse 8 says, they feel Jerusalem with the teachings of Christ. <clears throat> How long do I have, uh, Jeff? Uh, it's nearly done. Uh, it's already four past, uh, five past four. So if you okay. just... Yeah. Yeah. I'll just go very briefly. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. So in chapter 8 through 12, we find spirit-filled believers witnessing for Christ in Judea and Samaria. So the key passage here is Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And souls as went wild, devastating the church, entering the house after house after house, dragging men and women off to jail. First to leave home base, the followers of Jesus all became missionaries. Wherever they were scattered, they preached the message about Jesus. Chapters 13 to 28, we find the church expanding their Christian witness to the ends of the earth. The key passage in these sections is Acts chapter 13, one, uh, 1 to 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them on. So someone has said, The mark of a great church is not its sitting capacity, but its sending capacity. Churches are competing on how big our church is. How big? How many seating capacities? 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. So we are competing. We are uh, measuring the, the uh, saying that the, our churches grow when our, the seating capacity of the church is big. But my friend, somebody said, you know, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. How many missionaries have been sent from this church? We may not have a good building. We may not, our church may not be big, but are the draw of the church from the biblical perspective of missions is measured on how many missionaries have been sent. David Seaton has noted, we do not truly understand the gospel if we spend all of our time preaching it to the Christian. The gospel is a missionary gospel. So it is a communication of good news to people and in places where the name of Christ is unknown. This was certainly Paul's method of missions. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. So Paul states that. And we're come, uh, coming to the epistles, the epistles are largely letters from the missionaries sent to newly established churches and young church leaders. So the epistles, Pauline epistles and other epistles, it's all about missions. It's all about missions. They talk about missions. Missions, the contents of their letters is exhorting church missions to the church they have planted. We don't have time to discuss everything, but this is what God desired from day one in Genesis 1 when he said, fill the earth. And this is what God wanted when he told Abraham that in him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. John Stott said, the nations are not gathered in automatically. If God has promised to bless all the families of the earth, he has promised to do so through Abraham's seed. Now we are Abraham's seed by faith and the earth's families will be blessed only if we go to them with the gospel. So we are Abraham's seed and Paul was echoing this by faith, we are Abraham's seed again and again in his letters. That means our responsibility as Abraham's seed is to be a blessing for others. That is God's plain purpose in our life. It could not be plainer than this one. 
So finally coming to the book of Revelation, the, the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ was written by a missionary in exile, John. Notice what John, the revelator, saw. And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world. To every nation, tribe, language, and people, fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time he has come when he will sit as a judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of the water. The eternal good news of Jesus Christ is for every nation, tribe, language, and people. Carl F. H. Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. So this is the urgency of evangelism. The final call for you and I today as a church is that I believe God is calling his church for one last time to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. C.S. Lewis said, Jesus Christ did not say, go into the world and tell the world that it is quite right. Jesus did not say that. But Jesus said, go into the world and baptize the ends of the earth. Not to tell the world that it is quite right. God did not make a mistake when he chose you to bear Christ's name. At that hints of history, said David Shibley. He knew exactly whom he wanted to carry the light of the gospel in the 21st century. He wanted you. So the reason we are here today is because we received this call from the Lord. And he did not make a mistake in choosing you and I to bring this good news to the world, to the entire, to fill the earth. And God knew exactly what he wanted in our lives. Isabel Kuhn, missionary to China and Thailand said, I believe that in each generation, God has called enough men and women to evangelize all the, yet the unreached tribes of the earth. It is not God who does not call. It is man who will not respond. Yes, everyone is called by God, but it is man at the end who will not respond. Do you hear the call? William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, say, not call, did you say? Not hard the call, I think you should say, because God called everyone. You cannot say, I did not hear the call. I, I, I did not, God did not call me. You should say, I did not hear the call, not hard the call. So, this is the biblical basis of missions and three things we must do. Identifying the mission, that is, help people around the globe to find God. And then we have to believe in the mission, like Abraham believed God and walked by faith. And fulfill the mission, emulating Paul's patterns of missions, his strategy. So with this, I would like to conclude. Because uh, why do we say emulate Paul? Who could truthfully say, I have trailblazed a preaching of the message of Jesus all the way from Jerusalem, far into the Northwestern Greece. This has all been the pioneer work bringing the message only to those places where Jesus was not yet known and worshipped. So the text has been, those who never told of him, they will see him. Those who have never heard of him, they will get the message. Together as one body, let's do our best to ensure that those who have never heard of Christ will get the message before he comes again. As a church, as a mission agency, as an individual, let's work together. Let, let's be united with one heart and one mind with this mission, no, irrespective of our geographical location. I may be in India, you may be in, uh, in Kenya, and others may be somewhere in the West or Korea, but as a one body of Christ, we have to do our best to ensure that those who have never heard of Christ will get the message before he comes again. And this is our task. So my friends, uh, let's work together. Let's be united. This is the mission that God is 
giving us, putting on the responsibility on our shoulders. So what should we do with this responsibility? Let's continue to serve the Lord together for his own glory. Okay, thank you. I think that should be uh, uh, the end of my session. So thank you so much. Thank you. And over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your fantastic uh, presentation, um, Tan. And this is the time for the question and answer. So if you have any questions, uh, please, as I, as I mentioned, um, there's a reaction icon at the bottom of your screen. So just click that button and there's a, uh, you can see the icons uh, raising hands. So just click that one and ask any questions if you like. Okay, um, Dr. Joseph, you, you want to ask me? Thank yeah? you. Yeah. We would like to congratulate our speaker for enabling us to understand that the entire Bible is permitted with the mission matters. Indeed, we are also informed that uh, unless we take the gospel to the last parts of the world. So Dr. Joseph, so is that your question done or? Anyone uh, wants to share your ideas and thought, you want to make comment or you want to ask question to um, Reverend Tang? Yeah, it seems like no one wants to ask any questions because um, Reverend Tang's uh, presentation was wonderful, right? So no one wants to say anything? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, Dr. Paul, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I was asking uh, whether according to the speaker, all Christians and missionaries regarding the address of their possessions in the church. <clears throat> what do you think on this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me count the question. What is your thought on that? Do you think? What what is your 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 uh your understanding on that? <laughs> I think my reflection on that yeah. is that every Christian has an obligation. Every Christian is a missionary. Every okay. Christian should carry out the Great Commission. Whether you are a priest, a lay reader, an evangelist, a catechist, an ordinary Christian. We are all missionaries. That is my thought. Yeah, as uh, I have shared, uh, everyone is called to be a missionary. The Great Commission is equally given to, to everyone, not just to somebody who is just... Uh, as, uh, as I said at the end, if you are not responding to that call of God as a missionary, the Great Commission, that means you should not say that you, have not, you are not called by the Lord. You are called, but you have not responded. You have not heard the call. Everyone is called, 
but not everyone responded it. Not everyone has heard the call. So sure. uh, yeah. So with that, with the, since everyone is called, I think as you said, I agree with you. Everyone has the respond and obligation to be a missionary because this is what the the that is the heart of God. That is to be a missionary. Well, we can have different opinions. Others can have different understanding. But that is also my understanding that everyone is called to be a missionary, a Christian. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for your question, Paul, Dr. Paul. And um, so Samuel, uh, you want to ask any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yep. Now the 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 exercise of the the exercise of mission mission uh, going for mission is somehow very expensive. What should come first, accumulation of finances or moving out for mission? Can you repeat the question again? I can, I cannot uh, hear you. Uh, the, the full sentences, yeah. He is saying that uh, mission is costly. So do we start uh, with uh, looking for finances or on going out to carry out mission? Yes, it is costly because king of kings has to pay his life. He died and suffered at the cross for us. Not just it, it not only involves finances, it, it, it cost his life, the, the life of the only big attention. So mission is costly. But my I encounter questions like uh, yeah, the financial involvement of missions. But cities that the fire uh, the the founder of WEB say that, which is also considered as, as the theme of WEB, yes. if Jesus Christ be died for us, if Jesus Christ, which is God, who is God, and be sacrificed and died for us, there is no two sacrifices, no two costly sacrifices that I can make for him. I, I'm not uh, uh, quoting him uh, with, with this exact quotation, but this is uh, the what CT starts saying. Yes, mission is very, very costly. It costs the blood of Jesus Christ. It not just the blood; it costs even his life, the life of a king. But This is the command that, give, give, that God has given us. If we talk about uh, financials, or if we talk about uh, uh, the financial uh, securities and stuff, uh, oh, this is too expensive, you know? In my ministry of mobilization, I have been encountering so many questions, especially when it comes to foreign missions here in Northeast India. People will come and say, oh, sending foreign uh, missions to foreign countries is too expensive. With one support that you can support uh, for overseas missions, you can support three or four missionaries here in India domestically, and they can be very effective. So my answer to the, such kind of question was that what if missionaries who have come 100 years ago, 200 years ago uh, from the Western countries and who have come to our place and bring us the good news. If they also have the same uh, claim that mission is too expensive, it involves a lot of finance and did not come to our place. Who do you think who would bring, uh, how, would, how would we be saved? Would be, how would we be evangelized? So think about 100 years ago, think about 100, 200 years ago when the foreign missionaries 
brought the gospel to us. It's not because they have enough money. It's not because the church is uh, financially secure and stable, but it's because they love for the for uh, their, their obedience to the, the call, their obedience to the Great Commission, and their love for the Lord that no matter what, it might be very costly, it's very expensive. No air transportation, no road transportation, but they travel by seas months and months, and then they have to walk to carry the gospel, to evangelize us. But to that extent, they paid the price. So why don't you think about those missionaries? If had not been, had it not been for those missionaries who came to our place and bring the gospel, we would not be evangelized and celebrate 100 years of Christianity. So when it comes to, yes, finance involved, yes, lots of uh, sacrifices to be made, but yes, let's think, Jesus even pay his life for us. So there is no sacrifice that is too great for him, uh, for us to pay, to give him. Nothing compared to the sacrifice that the Lord has. Mission is very, very expensive. But the Lord say, the comforting word is, when Jesus gave this commission, he said, I will be with you always. So walk by faith, trust in him, and rely in him. And that's how God works in our life, in our mission agency. Work is hundred uh, over 100 years of its ministry. And believing in God, that God is, God is worthy of our absolute trust. Yes, faith, money, finance involved, sacrifices has to be paid, but we must do, we must continue. The Lord will be with us continuously because he promises to be with us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, because of the time limit, so we've, um, so we'll get just one more questions. Um, then we're going to have a um, 10 minute break instead of 20 because uh, we have another speaker um, sessions uh, following by. So